All right. Thank you all so much for coming today. This is a dual event with in-person here at Cardozo Law and also a Zoom webinar. We have 14 different law schools that have signed up to do their own watch parties to learn more about Earth Law and how New York City-centered law schools are forming their <laughs> academics and conversations and making sure that environmentalism, environmental stewardship, or any type of sustainability is intertwined into our legal education. We have some amazing esteemed panelists here today. And again, my name is Jenna Rackerby. I'm the president of Cordozo Environmental Law Society, and I organized this event. Um, and leading this discussion will be Tony Zell and Ethan Graham. So I'm gonna go ahead and have Ethan introduce himself and start off with introducing the panelists as well. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Ethan Graham. I'm a 2L here at Cardozo. I'm involved in the Environmental Law Society and I also got to take the Earth Law course this summer with Tony Zell. And I wanna start by introducing him and letting him explain a little bit about the Earth Law Center and then we'll move on to introducing the rest of the panelists. Well, thank you, Ethan, uh, for taking the class. Um, I am Tony Zell. Uh, I have with me uh, some other Earth Law Center members um, who have taught. Um, a couple of our panelists, Ms. Carol and Alexandra, have taught in our Earth Law class. And Earth Law is, as our title of our book says, Emerging Ecocentric Law. And it, um, it's not environmental law. Environmental law legalizes extraction, pollution, deforestation, desertification. All you got to do is follow the law. In earth law, that can't be legal. Or earth won't make it. We won't make it if we continue to engage much longer in legal systems in which that kind of behavior is permitted. So I'm going to pass the uh, mic to each one of you uh, to briefly introduce yourselves and to share with our group um, how might or how does earth law, as you understand it, come into play in your teaching or practice um, or your life, your worldviews. And I'll start with Alexander. Hello, everybody. It's a good evening for me because it's 1030 in Paris. And uh, thank you for having me. So um, I am a consultant in conscious governance and conscious leadership, and I am the director of academic development at the Earth Law Center since this summer. I've been working with Tony now for just about a year, and I was a student um, on the uh, Earth Law course last summer. So you can see that my trajectory has led me to uh, yeah, some very, very interesting development now and quite exciting uh, new development uh, in my career. Um, I was formerly um, a senior law lecturer in a UK university. Uh, I've got 20 years experience teaching mostly European Union law. Um, but, the, you know, as, as, as I've been teaching union law, actually, I, what I have realized is that the European Union was created to answer one of the biggest problems post 1945, which was the war. And it's been um, you know, ever since trying to solve many other problems like the pandemic. And today, one of the biggest challenge is um, our ecological um, situation. And um, the way that I actually perceive earth law is that this is actually not just about the law, it's about governance. So for me, it is um, absolutely crucial that we look at our legal systems. As Tony said, you know, he's talked about environmental law legalizing um, what I would term abusive human um, behavior. And Earth Law, I think, touches specifically at the heart of this, which is about ensuring that human behavior is not detrimental anymore. I don't want to actually, you know, take up too much time, so I'm just going to pass the, the mic on um, to the next. Uh, um, uh, Paulo, would you like to chime in? Uh, thank you. First of all, it's great to be here with you all, and um, I let me first of all introduce myself. I am Paolo Galizzi. I'm a clinical professor at Fordham Law School here in New York, and uh, I've been working on uh, sustainable development issues for the past 22 years, and uh, I teach, among other things, international law, human rights law, and occasionally international environmental law. And as Tony said, uh, maybe we should just change the terminology. And uh, for me, mm, 
what is earth law? I think I'm here, frankly, as much to share my opinions, but probably more to learn about what this is all about. And I did uh, find very interesting what Tony said at the beginning. Uh, your definition of environmental law is not the definition we will usually share with our students. We do not say that environmental law is about uh, essentially enabling environmental destructive activities. And that's a very interesting way to think about it and one that I certainly will reflect upon. But I think for me, the cost of earth law is uh, really this idea that the legal system and whatever law we teach in university and then that we practice really needs to be earth centric, if I can use this term, that we need to have fundamentally a shift in our approach to law, in our approach to human activities. And as lawyers and as teachers, we really need to revisit some of the concepts that I think we are so accustomed to, but that may have served their purpose before, but may no longer do so. So I think uh, what I have got so far and what I hope to engage more is the challenges that you with your thinking, Tony, are really pushing us to rethink and reinvent sometimes the way we do things and the way we think about things. And it's a challenge that I think is really very, very vital. I think what I think and what I think many of us probably think is that this is the time to do so. I think we read more and more about our planet being in peril. We see that very often law, rather than dealing with problem, enables problem. And that's that's my initial thought about this conversation. So thank you, Tony, for just stimulating this conversation and Jenna and thank everybody you. else for having us here. Thank you. Uh, you uh, brought up a, a, a really uh, critical point um, in, in shifting your perspective and, and it's paradigmatic shift, it really is. And I'm gonna ask Carl to uh, introduce himself and maybe you can comment on how Earth Law seeks to effectuate paradigmatic system change. Okay, thank you, Tony. I am very pleased to be have been asked to participate in this panel. I've been working for Tony for uh, over two years now. And as he mentioned, I have taught in the Earth Law program. Um, I had the benefit of, well, I'm in the old school. I'm, you know, Tony talked about how Earth Law is not environmental law. Uh, I've had 50 years of environmental law. Uh, and so this past couple of years has been a new way of thinking. And um, yeah, I think, and he mentioned that, you know, the environmental law is kind of based on the extract, you know, extraction of resources. I would go one step further and say, yes, it is based on the extraction of resources, but it's also based on the use of resources as a disposal place for our pollution. Uh, but what Earth Law, and I'm currently teaching um, environmental law and environmental justice at Quinnipiac Law School, and I see that Earth Law is kind of the, you know, the, the uh, consent, not the, the overlapping circles. Yes, there's environmental law. Yes, yes, there's Earth Law. But I think that particularly in the environmental justice area, that Earth Law can be uh, in, uh, incorporated uh, to get to get that new paradigm, okay, to as an advocate for disadvantaged communities uh, where there has been a resource extraction or there has been uh, pollution, you know, they have suffered the unfair burdens of pollution, uh, that if in becoming an advocate means embedding or using earth law principles, and in other words, I'm thinking specifically of the principle of how we are stewards of the resources, um, and so in getting those, that, that concept into the advocacy uh, is an important thing, and that's of particular interest to me. Um, did I answer your question, Tony? Yes, and you provided a wonderful segue. Uh, Earth justice is, um, right, I mean, justice is at the concept of law, at the core of the concept of law, and earth justice is obviously a huge concept, but it's a concept. If there's justice for Mother Earth, there's racial justice, there's gender justice, there's all justice, all of the divisions, all of the conflict over what is just will be subsumed if we advance the concept of earth justice. So I'll pass it to uh, Michael, would you like to um, introduce yourself? And again, share some thoughts about how earth law might fit in or does fit in with your practice. 
Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, putting this panel together, and I'm very excited to be participating in it. I am an associate professor of law at Vermont Law and Graduate School. Been here a whole few weeks now. Um, I'm directing the Environmental Advocacy Clinic at, at the school. Uh, I've, I'm a, a litigator by trade. I have litigated for all types of environmental organizations since I graduated from law school back in 1995. I ran the environmental law clinic at the University of Denver as well. And for about a decade between uh, 2013 until just this, this summer, I was the uh, general counsel and director of the wildlife law program for Friends of Animals, which is an animal rights-based organization. So it's interesting because I have an undergraduate degree in environmental philosophy. Uh, back then we called this deep ecology. I studied under Paul Shepard, uh, late Paul Shepard, he's a philosopher. Um, and he taught us to view our place in the world through the uh, sort of the, the eyes and the, the, the ears of indigenous views and feminist views. And so I really sort of came to my own understanding uh, of a larger e ecocentric approach to the work that I wanted to do. And then of course, as a litigator, uh, it often rarely comes into play. And I think that's a significant um, point which you would like to change, I'm sure. And, uh, I, and I have taken that initiative too. Uh, at Friends of Animals in particular, we started to develop a, a practical approach to what you might call an ecocentric approach by trying to argue that there should be some fundamental right um, uh, of ethical consideration that extends to the activities that we undertake um, that goes beyond the question of are we degradating an, uh, uh, an ecosystem? Are we harming a species? And instead really asks for us to look at this larger question of what does it mean to have a, have a meaningful ecosystem, a meaningful river system, a meaningful owl population? What does it mean to them? And we've taken the work of compassionate conservationists and um, Martha Nussbaum's work on capabilities theory and her approach to how that should apply to animals. And we're trying to incorporate it into our legal arguments in the courtroom. Thank you. And again, uh, you really opened my mind to something that is a practical problem. And this is a practical problem in earth law. Imagine that a river has legal personhood, can appear in court, and there's a lawsuit and what might she say? And in this thought experiment, as I've engaged in it, it's like, well, if I were the river, um, I'd say, well, this is what I want. I want to provide a habitat for the waterfall and the, and the, the, the water fauna and, 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 uh, and the birds and the fish. I want to provide uh, water for humans to grow food and for industrial um, work that that must be done. Um, and I want to flow the way I like to flow. And I can flow at lower um, volume, lower, um, you know, I don't have to have this as my maximum flow. I can compromise. I don't need that. Um, but engage in that thought experiment. How, what if we got that? How would we make our case? What questions would we want our client, the river, the beaver, and, and what conflicts do we have when the beaver says, hey, my job, my purpose, my role in the world on this planet, bite down, chop down trees, dam up rivers, a lot of disruption, and you know things don't fare well, and other things feel be fare better. It's great for the beaver. He's got all the food he needs, but not so great from the uh, uh, riparian <laughs> dwellers, the insects, the small uh, water species, they're not going to do well when the water comes up. So that orientation, that paradigm shifting, I can see it in you already. Thank you, Michael. Um, Jason? Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Jason Zarneski. I'm the Kerlin Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law and Associate Dean for Environmental Law Programs and Strategic Initiatives at the Elizabeth Haub School of Law at Pace University. Um, so I look at this question of what is earth law um, on the one hand with my professorial hat on as looking at research and scholarship and uh, sort of the definitional standpoint of environmental law. 
And then also with my administrative hat on, thinking about from a curricular standpoint uh, for our students and what our students need to know as future environmental law, law professors, or sorry, environmental lawyers. Some of you may become law. I lawyers. hope. <laughs> um, so I think um, the there's been much scholarship written by myself, uh, professors like Sarah Schindler and Todd Agard that have argued that the uh, taxonomy of environmental law has significantly expanded over the last uh, decade or two. Um, what began in a field that just included environmental law and natural resources law, moved to include energy law, land use law, now includes things like environmental justice, uh, food law, animal law, sustainable business, and ESG. Um, Earth law, you know, already, you know, sort of brings together many of these things, um, like international and global and comparative environmental law and administrative uh, law and environmental justice. So I think from a curricular standpoint, unless you're one of the handful of law schools that offer, you know, somewhere between 15 and 80 environmental law courses, I think the earth law curriculum is good because it brings together uh, so much of the existing canon um, that students can't take, you know, every one of those classes and it brings it together in a, in a single format where you can learn about the administrative and standing issues that exist in environmental law, the global and comparative issues, as well as things like the public trust doctrine, all, all into one. So from a curricular standpoint, I think there's great value for most law schools in the country. Um, from a conceptual framework, a, a theoretical framework, um, I guess I'm more skeptical uh, that it's actually a new area of in, uh, environmental law because the approaches in earth law already exist in the current more expansive canon. So what I think earth law is doing is, it, it, so it says it's doing, it's, uh, it's assembling uh, a host of sort of pioneering approaches to deal with environmental law where those approaches are more earth-centric or ecocentric, And I agree with Michael, um, Michael Harris that it, it feels a lot like the deep ecology view a lot of us learned about you know, earlier in our, in our careers. Um, I think that's a good uh, 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 goal because I agree that the current public environmental law regime um, has failed uh, to, to a great extent. And so I think more conceptually, I think what Earth Law is really about is this movement towards talking about environmental issues as something about fundamental environmental rights for a whole host of communities um, across the world that uh, deals with all three pillars of sustainability, not only environmental health, but social justice and economic welfare. And so I think what, what Earth Law is moving towards is sort of this, for lack of a better word, this constitutionalization of environmental rights and the recognition of those fundamental rights to also include non-human rights. Um, so I think as a, a curricular view, Earth Law is very helpful as a movement towards trying to make a more ecocentric view of these rights to nature and environmental rights as part of the process, uh, if we are gonna have our existing legal framework as a positive one, but I guess I'm a little bit more skeptical of what, whether it's actually a new part of environmental law, given that the canon has expanded so yeah. much. Ironically, that expansion uh, existing as a result of the failure of traditional public law, because if, you, if, if your traditional environmental law statutes aren't working, you're going to move into many other areas of law in order to achieve those environmental goals. Thank you. Uh, you've opened a window into the softer skills of earth lawyering. And it's a really a, a completely different body of practice called integrative lawyering. And um, earth law is more substantive as you pointed out, but earth law requires consciousness, the, the objectives, consciousness altering systemic change. And we want to equip law students to live healthy, full, happy, find different you know, metrics to measure your life, use happiness, not wealth, your hours worked, or, you know, this is a really critical part of, and you brought this up, of the philosophical underpinnings. It's like, where does this come from? Why should we act the way we do? To be in harmony with Earth is what all Earth's beings want. 
How do we do that confined within our legal systems? And there's so much to be done within the extant legal system, so much to be done. But ultimately, the systems have to change. And in my experience, limited as it is, um, the effect of working within the system can be immediate and very positive. Um, and it's rewarding, and we should do that. But we can't lose sight of the larger goal, which is this system cannot continue or humankind and most other beings on the planet won't continue. Uh, Maria, what do you have to say? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Maria Antonia Tigre. I'm uh, the Global Climate Litigation Fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. It's a huge pleasure to be here. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about climate litigation and how that intersects with, with earth law and some of the, the cases that sort of fall within that um, broader view of earth law uh, as, as has been discussed here. So um, the Sabin Center has a database of, of climate litigation cases uh, around the world. And now this has over 550 cases from um, almost 60 countries at this point. Um, and obviously these cases are brought under a wide variety of legal arguments and, um, you know, attempting a wide variety of different legal remedies. Um, and I think what's, uh, you know, what's interesting for the purpose of the discussion that we're having here is uh, looking a little bit at uh, some of the cases that are relying on the rights of nature and sort of indigenous traditional um, uh, worldviews to, to bring about this uh, change in, in, in climate change and sort of ask for mitigation or adaptation measures uh, within that sort of framework. Uh, and most, most of those cases are found um, either in Latin America or um, some other jurisdictions in the global south, like India, for example. Um, so I think it's interesting to have that sort of comparison and see how some of those different types of approaches are coming from the global south and challenging sort of the more traditional um, environmental approaches as have been talked about here as well. Um, and the majority are still pending. So there haven't, there hasn't, uh, there have been too many decisions yet, but I wanted to mention one uh, very uh, paradigmatic decision from Colombia that I think it's interesting for that, for those purposes, um, which was a case that was brought by, by mostly children and, and youth from Colombia. Uh, questioning deforestation in the Amazon rainforest in the, the Colombian portion of the Amazon rainforest. Um, and uh, the, the court actually, the, the, the court made a, uh, a very important decision, obviously recognizing that deforestation was happening and how um, that was infringing the rights of, of the, the youth of the population in Colombia, but also the rights of, of the Amazon rainforest itself. So it recognized the Amazon rainforest as a subject of rights. Um, and, um, and, you know, there were significant measures in terms of the remedies that were granted in, term, uh, in um, establishing a, an intergenerational pact and establishing a mechanism for uh, the legal protection of the Amazon rainforest. It was a very important decision, and I think uh, sort of in line with what Jason was talking about in terms of that skepticism as well. Uh, the whole problem with that is that that decision uh, hasn't been enforced yet, and it's been it's the decisions from 2018. So you know, you, at, on the one hand, there was this very significant decision that was all over the news, and it was very innovative. But then again, uh, it's been over four years and that hasn't, uh, that the decision hasn't been enforced yet. So there is a problem in terms of that accountability too. So I'll stop there for now. Well, that's great, Maria. Um, I would welcome uh, questions from those uh, remote viewers if you um, wanna put them in the chat um, or from the room um, or from a panelist um, or else I'm gonna ask a question. Hearing no others, um, let me put this out there. Um, hey, okay. Um, yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. So, um, Jason, you mentioned uh, the idea of like fundamental environmental rights and the like right to a clean and healthy environment. Um, 
I know that there are cases that have been litigated in the United States court system that like expressly reject this notion. So I was just wondering like how you balance this idea of like a fundamental right to a clean and healthy environment with the like practical notions of the United States courts. Yeah, so my my from what I heard of the question, the question is uh, the notion of environmental rights and if there can be such a thing as a fundamental environmental right given uh, some of the litigation happening in the in the state courts. Uh, so New York it now has a, a right to a healthy environment. Uh, many other states do, uh, like you know Montana. Um, so I think there, there, there's a legal question. So what does having a, a right to a healthy environment mean? On the one hand, is it just sort of a procedural or a legislative right? So it essentially only confers upon a legislative body like your state legislature, the ability to pass environmental laws. Um, and actually some of the recent uh, jurisprudence in some of the state courts, uh, you know, like a state like Wisconsin, where while they didn't have a right to a healthy environment, uh, they did have the public trust doctrine and the new jurisprudence has changed that from a constitutional right to just uh, saying that the legislature has the permission to pass statutes related to say wetlands protection or having uh, clean drinking water or clean navigable waterways. I think the difference is, uh, is it, could you make it more of a substantive right? So in other words, a self-executing right where anyone has standing to bring a case in court because anyone's uh, actions that somehow violate uh, your right to a healthy environment automatically gives you standing. So first is that standing requirement, can the constitutional uh, state right be self-executing in order for you to even get into court? Uh, then the second question is, what would be an issue that could rise to the level of violating your constitutional right? Um, I think the things are likely to be litigated are known clear harms for which the federal and state government know are a harm to you, but for which the feds and the state government uh, does not redress that no, known harm. Uh, I think the example are, is going to be PFAS or any other you know, major chemicals in the environment um, that we know are very harmful that there's inadequate legislation uh, to deal with, and perhaps uh, that uh, harms a right to a healthy environment. Um, I would also be curious in the future where there are clear um, impacts because of we are ignoring uh, environmental justice communities or a clear breakdown in uh, infrastructure, uh, whether we're talking about the situation in Mississippi or the, the situation that happened in Flint, Michigan, if ultimately that will lead to a violation of, of a type of fundamental environmental right, if those happened in states. Um, you know, amending the federal constitution, the US constitution is very difficult. Uh, so I think we're looking at state and, and local law uh, in this case, and can states uh, develop fundamental rights to a healthy environment that are self-executing, really substantive, and what will the state courts do in allowing plaintiffs into court and and I think importantly, um, are they going to find those injuries to be redressable? Thank you. Thank you, Jason. There is a case that will be decided next year, I expect. It's being briefed shortly uh, that will determine the extent of protections that can be executed, that can be constitutional protections that can be enforced uh, under the Pennsylvania Equal uh, Environmental Rights Amendment. and. Um, yeah, uh, it's a fascinating opportunity, and the Earth Law Center is well involved with the case. If you want to hear about it, I'm happy to share that. Um, I think uh, we have more time, Jenna, yeah. even though yeah. it's fine. We're going to go a little over time. Um, if you need to leave for class, feel free to excuse yourself. Um, but thank you all for the people who could make it, and you're going to stick around. Um, Ethan, yeah. you have a question from the chat. Yeah, we had a question that I think several of you probably would have something to say about, and it's concerning the intersectionality of human rights and earth rights. And, um, you know, right now, a lot of the environmental movement is proceeding from a human rights perspective. And so whether or not earth right or an ecocentric view conflicts with or complements a human rights based view. 
I'd like to hear what Alexandra has to say about that. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tony. Um, I, I wouldn't say that necessarily that it conflicts, but I think that the, 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 the premise that we start with a human rights paradigm is, is problematic because even the, the, the fundamental right or human right to a healthy environment is essentially looking at the environment for the benefit of the human species. It's not actually taking into consideration fully the fact that human beings are part of the earth community and not the pinnacle, not the top of the food chain in that particular um, respect. So I wouldn't necessarily say that there is a conflict, but I think that there is uh, a need to change the perspective that earth law in that sense encompasses human rights um, and therefore the human rights to you know a healthy environment and so on and so forth but then you know humans are also animals <laughs> so that would also be the same for animal rights in that sense that there should be fundamental animal rights to a healthy environment so i mean the way that i look at earth law is that earth law is uh, it incorporates all of the different ecocentric perspectives like wild law earth jurisprudence, you know, ecology of law, green legal theory, and so on. So yeah. I, 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 let me share um, that. Is there a little feedback? Oh, that's better. Um, so the Earth Law Center, uh, accessible pretty readily on our website, is the co-violations reports of human rights and nature's rights. And it was last compiled uh, in 2017. Uh, and we are involved in an ongoing project to update it. And these are cases um, all over the world um, where environmental defenders die or are imprisoned or um, abused um, because they're trying to protect nature. Uh, and I encourage all to, to look into this, again, the intersectionality of human rights and nature's rights. Uh, other questions, comments, thoughts? If not, oh, um, Michael, uh, I think I can unmute you. Um, I don't mean to. Uh, if we're finishing up, I'm fine with that. I just no, thought let's I, keep going. I just thought I'd throw something in there. I think I think it's actually not difficult to find conflicts or points of contention if you look, and I do think it's important not to avoid them and to make sure that we're appreciative of them. Um, because we need to understand the views from those who may be more focused on the human rights side of this question and those on the eco rights side of it. I do think, though, that, you know, there's also just a lot of real possible connection and um, similarities there. You know, I think I, I liked what you had to say, Tony, earlier about a river being able to relinquish some of its flow. And sometimes the question um, about the rights of a river becomes so focused on the river's independence that, you know, we forget that it exists to sustain other life, including ours, and that there needs to be that discussion too. And on the um, environmental eco rights side, I mean, I think there are so many communities, uh, urban communities, communities of color, communities of um, rural communities that can benefit from rights and nature designations, um, whether it's green spaces, land, air, water. Um, it's interesting, we have been approached by a, by a tribal client involved in a, in a very long ongoing um, circle issue uh, on tribal lands. And, uh, you know, the students and, and, and the lawyers are all ready to gear up on some, you know, mainstream environmental law solutions. But the first thing they ask for is, can we get a rights of nature designation here? And so I also, there was a quote by Terry Tempest Williams, you know, she was once asked how she can possibly compare um, the, the sort of the, the killing uh, by, by basically by gassing uh, prairie dogs in Utah with um, what, what amounts to genocide, right, in, in, in Central Africa. And, you know, she realizes that's, that's a fair question. And I think that's why we need not to avoid the conflict. But she also made the observation that, you know, if there was any way we could lift the moral standing of a prairie dog, it only makes the arguments against genocide so much stronger, right? And, I, and I've, you know, taken that as, as, a, as a really important point to, to, to make. And it's still a fair question, and there's got to be a discussion about it. Thank you. We have a, a question from the remote. 
Okay, there's a question from the Q&A and I'll, I'll read it all out. This is from Kevin Colley. And the question goes, have we considered this perspective seriously? The deepest cause of the present devastation is found in a mode of consciousness that has established a radical discontinuity between the human and other modes of being and the bestowal of all rights on the humans. All human activities, professions, programs, and institutions must henceforth be judged primarily by the extent to which they inhibit, ignore, or foster a mutually enhancing human slash earth relationship. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I, I didn't quite discern the question, but thank you. I mean, it is um, in African, Ubuntu is the concept. It is, I am only because I'm in relation with. I am what you reflect to me. Um, beautiful question, thank you. I was a Thomas Berry quote. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> there we go. Do any thank of the you. other panelists have a, have a thought on that question? Or a Thomas Berry quote, I'm all in favor of reading that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, um, got a couple of hands raised. Um, since uh, Michael's one of them, and now there's no more. Oh, Carl. Carl. All righty. Go on, Carl. Yeah, I'm still following. Okay, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I think that um, it's fine to talk about, and it's important to talk about. The concepts that we've talked about, but I think that uh, that the work has to be actually done uh, in the trenches, in the courtrooms, in the legislatures. And I, you know, when I, I a thought came into my mind as I was listening to Jason, and I think the I think I'm agreeing with it. If we're looking to federal guidance, um, you know, we all know the constraints of federal guidance, but I think that. Uh, where the action really is and is really going to be is at the, the local level and at the state level. That's where uh, that's where the communities, and speaking from an environmental justice and a civil rights perspective, um, you know, that's where the action is going to be. It's going to be in the communities at the local level and at the state level. Um, so that's that's what I think is going to happen. I think it would be interesting to hear about the global perspective on this. So maybe Professor Galizzi and Dr. Antonio Tigre, um, if you all have any thoughts on why other countries have been more quick or, or slower to adopt earth law concepts, um, or if you have any thoughts, I know the IUCN program has included some nature-based approaches and what sort of impact that has and maybe what implications that has as well. Please, Maria Antonia, if I may, you can go first and then I'll follow you. Please go ahead. Right. <laughs> and you can call me Paolo. It's totally fine, please. Um, I think there's a there's a huge skepticism still worldwide on, on those types of approaches. Um, I think the countries where um, the rights of nature have developed a little bit more have a, a, a cultural um, sort of a shared cultural background that facilitates that um, the adoption of such measures um, and, and that certainly helps. And I think that's why it has developed a little bit more. Thank you. Um, I think if we actually go back, uh, there was an Earth Charter for Nature that was adopted at a given time that unfortunately wasn't particularly successful in terms of uh, it becoming uh, customary law, treaty, et cetera, et cetera. But I would say, you know, many of these problems, I think what I like about the concept of earth law, whether it's new or old or what it means or what it doesn't mean, is the fact that I think it really requires us to just think about those issues in a different way. And I think that's really what is necessary. And at the global level, we also need to think more about the connection of issues and the fact that if you solve problem A, you may create problem B and C and D and work to try to solve the solution rather than against one another, but with each other. And I think, you know, we need to have solutions at the global level. Some conversations need to be addressed at the global level because unless all countries agree, for example, to tackle climate change, it's gonna be very difficult for just one country alone or impossible according to science 
to solve the problem. But of course, then the action needs to trickle down all the way to the local level. I think I agree with what Maria Antonia said. I think at the global level, when I do a lot of work in Africa, in other developing countries, even talking about environmental law in many countries is difficult because for many governments, the priority is poverty eradication that very often is seen as antithetical to environmental protection as environmental protection is very often seized rather than enabling the destruction of the environment, the curtailing of development. And therefore, I think many of these conversations are needed. And I think what is interesting to me at the global level, you are forced to, not forced, but I would say you really need to hear each other out and understand the different priorities and try to see where people can come together. The concept of sustainable development was supposed to be the concept of reconciled development and environmental protection. It was supposed to integrate all of these issues. I don't know how far that has gone. Some have said that the concept of sustainable development is the idea that is the illusion of progress, that there is no such thing. And, you know, I talk to colleagues that work on sustainable fashion, that talk on sustainable tourism, trying to reconcile all sort of human activities with the planet that may not be able to cope with all that we're doing. But, you know, to cut the, the this my, my, my brief intervention is that I think global, local, state, all the way to any level, including individual, we need to find a way to connect all these dots and see how we can really work on all the different level. And my question would be, you know, how can I as a lawyer working, in my case, at the international global environmental level, how can I work with others to make sure that, you know, that we all work towards what is a common goal? Yes. to really preserve the planet with all its pieces and use legal tools and legal understanding and legal concepts in a positive, constructive way towards this goal rather than in a destructive way. And I must recognize in the land that I think at times I feel that law has been used to destroy rather than to create and to create more problems rather than solve them. And that probably is something that we all need to reflect upon and see what we can do to change. And I think this is a conversation in that direction. Thank you so much, Paolo. Uh, Alexandra, you want to share some thoughts? Yes, I wanted to say that, that, that this, this was really great. Um, I'm, I'm just bouncing off on some of the ideas that, that we've heard, um, particularly the, um, the idea of, of, you know, trying to reconcile as well the conflict and so on. Um, I think, personally, I think that one of the key issues is that the focus on, on the rights-based paradigm can be problematic because when we focus on the rights, then that's when we also can focus on the conflict or see the conflict arising. But when we talk about rights, we have to talk about responsibilities, because where there are rights, then there has to be someone who is responsible for those rights. And when we're talking about human rights, I feel that we're bringing in the earth and you know its species, the, the whole ecosystem within the human system. Whereas when we talk about earth law and earth rights, we are doing the other way around, where we're bringing in the human system within this earth-centered paradigm. And I think when we do that, then I believe that we do bring then the, the responsibility paradigm as well, whereby human beings do not just have rights, um, but we have responsibilities. And I think if, the way that we can actually work towards a common higher vision or a common you know, purpose here is to understand that we are responsible for our actions and that our laws should reflect that rather than just you know, um, paving the way for anything that we want because you know, it's not just because we can that we should, but that our laws should also reflect our ethical values. You know, at, at the end of the day, if we do not respect the earth, if we do not do anything for it, we're going to perish. It's not about saving the planet. The planet is going to replenish without us anyways. It's about really saving, you know, the human species and every other species that we are, you know, extinguishing in the process of being extractive and thinking that, yeah, I've got rights and, and I, I just want to have my rights. No, I have responsibilities towards my community, which is the earth community. So... Jason, do you want to piggyback? Yes, if I could, I, you know, sort of putting on my administrative hat here and, and thinking about, you know, creating careers of meaning for our students as they are our lawyers um, and, and responding to Alexandra's statement about 
well, how do we think about, you know, protecting, you know, what's there as opposed to sort of a reactive approach. And so many of our environmental students, right, interested in environmental law, when you ask them what jobs they want, you know, they want to work for government entities and nonprofits and do environmental litigation. Those are all reactive industries, right? They look for people who have already polluted the environment and then we respond to it. Whereas the, the true believers, if you will, um, they're less likely to work in uh, corporate law firms for general counsel for major companies that engage in development and extractive industries. And so, you know, I, I think we said we might say, well, wouldn't it be nice to have some people who really care about environmental law and understand it really well? to be crafting the policies of those major companies that are engaged in the development. So they're proactively thinking about these things. So 15 years ago, none of the major law firms in the country had any sustainable business or ESG practice groups. Now 42 of the AMLAW top 50 firms do. Students are starting to be placed in those jobs. GCs at major law firms are environmental lawyers. Vice presidents of sustainability for major corporations are now lawyers. Um, rather than thinking about good guys and bad guys, uh, or good companies and bad companies, or or a bad industry, let's place environmental lawyers, you know, across the spectrum so we can be pro proactive and reactive, and insert some of the values in the industries in the development we all are consumers yes we need to reduce consumption which is a whole other story which we need to talk about mm -hmm. but to the extent to the extent that everything we're looking at in front of us doesn't even meet a minimum definition of sustainability i think it would be nice to insert some of those values into some of those actors that we often deal with too reactively and they can be proactive can I bounce back on this? Sorry, but Jason, I completely 100% agree with what you have just said. Because what, what's the what's the saying? You know, be the change that you want to see, and and you know, any change actually occurs from within. So it's within from within ourselves, but we are also part of a bigger system. So we can't, you know, if you stand outside of the system, you can't change it. You can only break it or derail it. But in order to actually really affect real change, we have to be within. So absolutely, 100%, we have to go out there and we have to engage with all of these corporations and all of these big businesses that are actually part of the same system that we are in. You know, Ubuntu, they are us and we are them as well. This is us as a whole. So we absolutely have to be involved and we have to educate ourselves and each other in that way. Thank you, that's a wonderful segue. That's great. As we are heading into finishing up here, we have a room full of law students, again, we have 14 different law schools logged on right now, hosting their own different watch parties. I wanna give every single panelist the opportunity for some closing remarks. And I want your closing remarks to really be reflective on not just the, the total idea of gratitude and being thankful for the opportunities we're given, but how we as law students can take your wisdom and knowledge and love and put it into our career. Um, what would you tell yourself when you were a one, two or three L? And what would you tell yourself as you were learning and developing your own practice um, outside of just academics? Um, so I want to give every single person the opportunity to kind of reflect on that and give us some advice to, you know, how we can be better and how we can be, you know, better environmental or lawyers. Um, can I start? Have... Yes, of course, <laughs> please. Um, the first thing that I would say is just, um, you know, endeavor to be the best version of yourself and follow your bliss. You know, listen to your heart and understand your values and understand your operating principles in this lifetime. And, and, you know, dare to dream, dare to be great. Polly Higgins wrote this amazing book about, you know, daring to be great. And she's, she's changed the world, you know, in, in, in incredible ways with the, the, the movement with Ecoside in particular. And what she stated was, you know, we are part of something that is bigger than ourselves. And that is greatness. We are all called to greatness. So we just have to feel what it is that we want to do, follow our heart in that sense and be true to ourselves and identify your mission. Nobody's gonna tell you what your mission is. You know, you're the captain of your own ship. You're the hero of your own life. 
of your own journey. So you have to decide what it is your, you know, what is your mission and what you want to do and go for it and trust the process because you may actually be taking all kinds of different pathways. I mean, I, I started with, you know, my passion around environmental law. That's what I wanted to do when I first graduated. And I went completely the opposite way. <laughs> and, you know, 20 years later, here I am doing exactly what I love. So, yeah, trust you, follow your bliss. Michael, would you like to go next? Sure. So that's a very, that's, a, that's an interesting question for sure. So, you know, I think what I would say to myself is that as a, a law student and a young lawyer, a new lawyer, you know, I felt so equipped with these new legal tools to help solve, you know, all of these problems. And I thought the law was the solution. And of course, you know, we have laws that have amazing foresight to them. And in this country, especially, right, laws that, um, that to this day still have significant give to protect the, the natural world. They're not stale. But I guess what I would say to myself is, you know, look outside the law. I think it's so important. For me, the last decade of my career and my, you know, the litigation I bring has been, um, uh, I would say, looking at stuff like ca compassionate conservationism looking at philosophical approaches, um, integrating that into arguments um, under federal statutes like NEPA. And I think that there's just, for one thing, uh, the law moves slowly, uh, the legislative process moves slowly. We're stuck with a lot of laws that haven't changed a lot, but other fields don't have those same restrictions. And so we've seen so much movement in them. I think that the way science has evolved on issues of going beyond a, you know, an anthro procentric approach and looking more from the standpoint of animals and from nature is so much farther ahead right now than the law. And, you know, I didn't really think of that as a, as a place to aspire to focus on um, coming out of law school. Thank you so much. Carl, would you like to go? Sure. Um, I, my reflection is that, uh, you know, as lawyers, young, young trained lawyers coming out of law school, looking at their first career, one of the first decisions that need that folks need to make is you know, what kind of where am I going to focus my job search? Because everybody has to work and earn a living. Um, where are, am I going to work for communities or a law firm that represents communities? Am I going to work for nonprofits, environmental organizations, uh, clinics like uh, you know like the Vermont Law Clinic? Uh, but representing, being able to bring the Earth law, the ecocentric, uh, the anthropocentric, or I'm sorry, the ecocentric view to developing uh, proposed legislation or proposed regulations or petitions for regulations uh, or bringing lawsuits on behalf of environmental justice communities. There's a, I think there's an opportunity there uh, to bring those earth law concepts into uh, the job search into the, the everyday work at a job and into the strategizing about uh, what you're actually doing uh, at a, and again at a, at a working level. Certainly. Maria, would you like to go next? Um, so I would say be curious in, um, you know, look at other legal systems, see what they're doing, uh, find always a comparative perspective because there's so much to learn from other uh, from other legal systems, other perspectives, other you know worldviews. Um, so I think always be, be curious is a, is a good one. Paulo? Thank you. I think it's hard now to give more advice. I think overwhelmed advice. Let me say this. I think one thing that I think it's important is to know what you want to do in life, but also not to be scared about what you don't know. Like I remember when I was a student like you, I had some ideas about what I wanted to do. And some of my colleagues were in law school and they knew exactly, they had their whole life planned out. And some like me were not really sure and uh, were trying to understand which direction they were supposed to be going. And I remember the direction that I decided to go was very much uh, fate in the sense that, you know, in Italy, at the time we studied in Italy, you have to do your final dissertation in uh, a particular area. I went to see a professor that was supposed to supervise me. 
And I was like, I don't really want to spend the next three months working with this person because the vibes were not particularly good. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with a professor that actually I really loved working with. And that's how I ended up being an international Ooh. lawyer. And I ended up in New York. Had I chosen the other professor, probably I would be doing corporate law in Milan. So just, you know, follow your own path. Sometimes fate it chooses a path for you. Just be prepared for whatever fate brings your way. And the last thing is just follow your path. You know, you are one individual. Being a lawyer is part of that. Decide what you want to do with the one life that you've been given and what you want to serve uh, law with. That's, that's what I would say. Vibes are very important. No law, just vibes, right? As Pete Shaw will say. Um, to be my Italian ancestry that, you know, we take everything serious, but not excessive. <laughs> Jason, would you like to go next? Uh, I guess I've given already a little bit of career advice. <laughs> There's so many. I've been, I've been thinking about this idea of, of earth law as a paradigm shift in the way we think about things. And so I guess I have some advice and, and you know, perhaps I recognize that this advice comes from, you know, somewhat my own you know, position of privilege as a tall white man with a, you know, a powerful administrative position and a, and a fancy title, but I would encourage everyone to, to speak truth to power and to um, point out injustice when you see it and point out that injustice in a polite, kind, and not angry way. Uh, we turn on the news and we're at a pivotal moment in sort of the history of the earth, perhaps, when you look around, floods, war, um, if you see somebody idling their car in front of a school, ask them politely to stop. If you see somebody parked in a bike lane uh, in a crosswalk so someone with a wheelchair can't get across it or a bicycle can't, ask them to move their vehicle. Um, if you see somebody littering, ask them to please pick it up. And if you see someone mistreat another human being or an animal on the planet, ask them not to do it. Um, I think the world could use a little bit more kindness right now. And I think that if you bring that sort of thoughtfulness uh, and when you see wrong happening and you call it out and you do it kindly, um, that would go a long way into cleaning up our planet. It would go a long way. So we all worked and lived in a more pleasant and collegial environment. And so I'll guess I'll end uh, the way I land all my classes, which is I hope all of the students in light of the pandemic, uh, you know, and everything you went through just take care of your intellectual, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, would you like to? Uh, sure. Um, I, I would advise uh, my 22-year-old self uh, to listen to my mother. <laughs> my mother's heard. As I've heard throughout the comments, um, what are my values? I've spent great amount of time in later life, orienting them. It's serenity, it's community, it's integrity, it's friendship, and it's spirituality. And if I had that in mind as a embarking on my legal career, um, it would have made me a earthly. I would be finding the ways to help Mother Earth um, through the legal system. And I would reflect upon my skill sets. I knew I was cut out to be a courtroom lawyer. And I would find a way to live within my values and seek my mission. My mission is to make earth law and make earth lawyers. And I want to express gratitude because that's the best tool in my toolbox. And ask that anyone who wants to pursue this path um, help me get Earth Law into your schools. I will travel, um, generally looking for a couch to sleep on, if you can help there, that's cool. Um, and I, I would do whatever I could to help bring Earth Law and make Earth your lawyers in make community with you all, so. Thank you all. I'm extremely appreciative of every single panelist that's here today, every single viewer, every school that has participated. Um, if anybody has any further questions, comments, or concerns, or you want to reach out to receive the contact information from all any of our panelists, answer any further questions, please go to cordozo env law, like environmentallaw.com. It's our website. There's a contact form. I'm happy to answer every single email personally and make sure that you get your answers question or your questions answered. Um, we're extremely grateful for all of our Cordozo students that are here in person. 
and it was you know a great event and we hope that if anything it helps you just think develop reflect on what it means to not just be a human and a member of our community but to be a lawyer an advocate a friend and to be a more powerful person in our community so thank you all again for being here we love you all